today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, again, uh, the theme of pivoting your food business to address COVID-19, uh, a strategic mindset for uh, kind of this new normal. Um, uh, and then again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll, uh, and then we'll try to answer them probably at the end. But um, uh, you're also, if, if, you, if there's something particularly urgent, just to unmute and, uh, and then go ahead and ask. Um, so again, a little bit about us. Uh, we're, uh, um, we're almost 30 years old, serving uh, the Latino and other underserved communities through asset building. Uh, preservation interventions and housing and small business development. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, we have offices uh, here in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and, and in Puerto Rico. Uh, my name is JB, and I'm a senior small business coach and liaison here. Uh, before uh, working with uh, uh, LEDC, I, uh, I uh, helped run a small furniture manufacturer based in Fairfax, Virginia, where we uh, we built furniture kind of all over the country, um, well, in, in about five different states in the U.S., as well as in Ecuador and Vietnam. Uh, so again, operating a business in a pandemic, not one restaurant, small grocery, cater, uh, or any other business for that matter, developed a business plan that projects success at 50% or less uh, capacity, um, you know, plus uh, additional unforeseen costs. Um, and that's kind of why we're all here today. Um, uh, I like to remind uh, all of uh, uh, you know our clients and, and people we interact with that uh, you know entrepreneurs are fearless, and this is a particularly important time to remember that, and that you are in a uh, class by yourselves. So I wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, kind of priority one, uh, the short term, uh, you know, now the important things to be thinking about uh, strategically for your business. Um, you need to be protecting your employees and your customers, uh, and you need to be staying informed uh, because things keep changing. Um, and uh, these are four sites that I uh, check, uh, like to kind of keep on top of. It's often the raw uh, data of, uh, of changes that are on the forefront. And uh, I, I recommend highly um, that you sign up for email alerts and so on from these, uh, from these four sites. Uh, let's talk uh, very quickly about best practices, which uh, interestingly enough is very uh, top of mind in the news today, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. Uh, but um, in protecting your customers and your employees, uh, just reinforcing um, that uh, uh, these four best practices, uh, we'll go through them very quickly, but uh, uh, being healthy and clean uh, employees, uh, that, uh, that they stay at home or leave work if sick, uh, absolute must. Employers should instruct sick employees to stay home, uh, and if they come to work, send them home immediately. Um, pre uh, employers should pre-screen employees exposed uh, to COVID-19 for temperature and other symptoms. Again, wash hands often, avoiding uh, uh, touching eyes, nose, uh, mouth with unwashed hands. Uh, probably the number one is wear a mask, uh, face covering. Um, there was an article today about an outbreak in, um, uh, in Asia at a Starbucks and uh, um, and I'll show you the article in a bit, but uh, the amazing thing was that the employees were all spared and they were the ones uh, wearing masks. Um, again, never touch ready to eat foods with bare hands, use single service gloves, deli tissue, so on. Um, and then of course, wrap food containers to prevent cross-contamination. Again, on the theme of protecting employees and customers, uh, uh, if to train employees, cleaning and disinfecting procedures, um, uh, make cleaning products available, uh, follow protective measures, disinfect high touch surfaces, uh, ensure food containers and utensils are cleaned and sanitized, um, and, uh, and then offer, uh, you know, in the, in the 
theme of making these products available is offer hand sanitizer or wipes to customers as they uh, as they come into your establishments. And again, uh, emphasizing social distance. Uh, uh, and it's important to keep uh, educating employees and customers on the importance of this uh, uh, policy um, using uh, uh, and using signs and, and other ways to, to communicate that. Avoid displays uh, that may result in uh, uh, customer gatherings. Um, uh, discontinue self-service buffets, uh, salad bars, and so on. Discourage uh, uh, gather gatherings, whether it's employees or customers. Place floor markings and signs to encourage social distancing. Shorten customer time in the store to encourage them uh, to uh, encourage them to use, uh, uh, you know, sort of shopping lists, order ahead of time, and so on. And then, of course, uh, pick up and delivery. Again, making it as efficient as possible to uh, and as seamless and touchless as possible. Um, uh, here's the article from today's. Uh, um, actually from yesterday's, uh, uh, I think it was in Bloomberg yesterday, but uh, there was an outbreak at a Starbucks um, in Korea. And, um, and the interesting thing about the story is that I think somewhere uh, more than 20 people uh, were affected, 27 visitors, I guess. Um, but the em Starbucks employees all wearing masks uh, were, uh, were spared. Uh, moving to the kind of the medium term um, that uh, strategically companies need to be thinking about. Uh, number one is protecting margins. Uh, this is a period of uh, when uh, businesses have to figure out ways to survive um, and they've got to hunker down and, uh, and, and protect uh, as much cash as possible. Um, obviously selling online, making use of apps, uh, reassigning employees uh, to uh, you know to to work where needed. Um, one of our best customers says that his most important asset now in employees are, the, are those that can multitask and that can do everything from cooking to uh, to managing their social media accounts. Uh, part of this is simplifying processes. Uh, the kitchen operations have to be streamlined, minimizing contact. Uh, streamlining menus again to ensure that your items uh, protect your margins. Um, the th the uh, with the advent of uh, delivery and um, uh, restaurants are paying you know sometimes upwards of thirty percent commission to uh, to gain those sales, and um, and the best uh, restaurants are replacing those lost margins. Uh, by gaining efficiency elsewhere. Um, part of this is listening to your clients um, and understanding how uh, their new uh, needs and wants will affect uh, types of menu um, that you need to offer uh, and that they have to be more conducive to delivery, for example. Um, uh, again, one of our best clients described it for me that a dish that arrives cold is just is just simply bad for business. Uh, listen to changes in demand. Innovate as you adjust offerings. Um, we've had uh, you know unconventional takeout since this began. Uh, heat uh, and uh, heat and eat dishes, meal kits, uh, fun uh, uh, marketing campaigns, meal donations. Um, and uh, carry out cocktails. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and then even uh, uh, you know, picnic baskets, uh, um, paella to go, where you bring the pan back the the next day when you're done. And then it's important strategically in this uh, period of surviving to to keep connecting. Uh, I like to call it connecting a strategy. Supercharge your social media, inform, promote, connect. Um, uh, you know, uh, these are some uh, highlights from uh, uh, various media campaigns from our clients and some others, but uh, buying gift cards, um, greeting guests, keeping that communication open, informing them of the basics when you're open, any changes that occur, 
new menu options that are uh, on the that you're thinking of, um, but keep that uh, sort of hyper, be hyper focused on uh, communicating uh, with your uh, with your clients. And incidentally, um, keep uh, uh, LEDC has a number has done a number of webinars. Uh, devoted to uh, social media um, and some of those are available to watch afterwards and uh, and in some cases we can also help uh, clients sort through specific uh, uh, social media uh, uh, kinds of assistance um, this is a communication checklist that uh, uh, I like to reference um, but uh, you know, your communication should always be focused on customers. Your clients want to see you as a brand that understands what you need and want. Uh, make your messages relevant. You know, you don't want to waste your client's time. You want to use social media to show how you respond to the pandemic. Be empathetic and authentic. Uh, listen to what people are saying. Identify consumer emotions and developing trends. That helps uh, you to uh, figure out maybe new products or things that you can take advantage of demonstrate values um, kind of those values that help guide your business are an important way to connect with why people uh, do business with you uh, and then don't be intrusive or insensitive uh, use social media to keep the relationship with your customers going um, you know while at the same time acknowledging that things are not business as usual <clears throat> COVID-19's impact on uh, consumer behavior, kind of thinking ahead uh, as this starts to uh, unwind. Um, Post-crisis, uh, um, and this is uh, from a study from McKinsey and Company uh, called uh, Delivering When It Matters, uh, but um, they've done uh, a, a lot of studies in how um, this crisis has played itself out in other markets, like uh, in, uh, in China and in some parts of Europe and these are some of the trends that they uh, see and that they expect uh, will uh, will be seen here as well uh, but in terms of spending uh, post-crisis uh, spending on in restaurant dining is expected to be lower even uh, as things uh, get normal um, after the uh, and, and some of that is related to uh, the unwillingness of uh, people to kind of be in social uh, public spaces uh, where there are going to be, uh, you know, crowds where there's going to be some density. Um, after the pandemic, expect increased spending on food delivery, prepared foods, and uh, groceries compared to pre-pandemic spending. And restaurants that are using this period to uh, learn and leverage what they learn about um, delivery and prepared foods uh, are going to be well positioned. Um, financial strains and lingering uh, concerns about eating in crowded places. Consumers will likely continue to prefer eating at home, at least for a time. Uh, in other words, uh, business will come back, but it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be slowly. Uh, here's a little grid again of uh, some of their analysis of what happened in uh, in China but um, they see an accelerated shift to grocery and uh, food delivery uh, that uh, um, that they anticipate persisting um, as you can kind of see in this grid uh, sort of during uh, versus before COVID-19 dine-in restaurants uh, was down uh, 41 uh, 41%, takeout was down 29%, food delivery down 20%, ready-made 12 and so on. And then after uh, they expect, uh, you know, they expect uh, dine-in not to grow, not to recover as fast, but things like takeout and food delivery uh, will probably exceed uh, previous levels as well as uh, ready-made food from groceries and, uh, and of course, grocery store purchases. Uh, longer term, again, it's this theme of building on strengths, uh, leveraging what you are learning, 
uh, digital channels will be a permanently important part of the business. Um, expect, uh, again, greater concern about hygiene and safety, which, which again, is uh, all things restaurants are learning to do now. They're learning to do it well and efficiently. Um, more focus on efficient menus and strong supply chains um, so that they can, uh, uh, that sort of breeds agility and the ability to, um, uh, to adjust uh, even in a post-pandemic uh, world to, uh, to other consumer trends. Uh, this is a this is a theme that uh, um, is kind of all across industries, but that the pandemic is accelerating change that was coming anyway. Um, and these are some of the uh, trends that we're seeing in um, uh, in some of our clients. Uh, and um, but uh, things like uh, moving toward uh, you know for sit down restaurants, moving more toward no tipping policies. Uh, kind of resetting how restaurants are organized um, and uh, stabilizing wages uh, between the various uh, parts of the restaurant. The restaurant profession in general uh, will become more appreciated um, and uh, the uh, people kind of miss the dining experience uh, that uh, comes with, uh, that makes dining out so special. Uh, ghost kitchens or shared facilities um, so that, uh, you know, one kitchen can maybe service uh, multiple, uh, multiple uh, um, distribution uh, channels uh, and, and whether this is a better business model uh, going forward. Uh, increasing uh, product mix uh, from alcohol to delivery to pantry items uh, to complete dinner deliveries. Um, uh, certainly alcohol uh, uh, cocktails as part of uh, uh, takeout and delivery orders uh, is expected to stick around. Uh, more efficiency. The industry has gained amazing experience with efficiently prepping, packaging, and delivering meals. And as an industry, they will be primed to do more with less as business comes back. Uh, simpler menus with lower waste, more local sourcing. Um, and then restaurants as prepared grocers uh, from whom you might buy, uh, might order several finished sides, uh, bottle ingredients for cocktails and so on. Uh, items that you uh, uh, that are partially cooked and you finish cooking at home. Uh, and then this theme of an all delivery economy that uh, the foods that travel well will be, uh, uh, will be more of a part of what is produced. Um, and uh, particularly those meals that cannot be recreated easily at home. <clears throat> And then this uh, increased use of technology, sort of the theme of reducing the steps to order is only going to be more and more uh, uh, an important part of, uh, of this business. So I want to turn it over now to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Benga Ogunjimi, who runs Go Global. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, storytelling as it relates to uh, your uh, strategic thinking uh, now uh, and going forward. Um, and I'd like to uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, Benga to introduce himself and uh, and share what. Uh... Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, JB. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and inviting me back. My name is Benga Hunjimi. I'm from a business called Go Global. And what we do, we help businesses tell and monetize their stories. Um, my business has been a partner with LEDC, and we've been working across the DMV area, uh, particularly working with also uh, the food industry, businesses in the food industry. And pretty much uh, we've been, we've been uh, working on this idea that storytelling is the new marketing. 
And as we go through innovation in our business model, and as we begin to look at ways in which we can think outside of the box and operate in this new normal, what I want to do for the next 10 to 15 minutes is to try to make a case or try to amplify the idea, the role your story would play or can play in this new opportunity that we have. So what we are going to be looking at is um, unlocking the power of your personal story, as well as your business story. Um, for those of us who do not yet have a business story, I wanna give us some tools to start this process of thinking about how can we craft a business brand story and how can, be, how can that become a marketing strategy and collateral for our business. The third component is how do we monetize the story? As I said, storytelling is the new marketing. And if you think about this unique environment that we all have to operate in, more than ever, we have to make a compelling case for our clients in terms of differentiation. Why should they continue to do business with us particularly now that we have lost um, part of the assets in terms of physical space that used to be a strong factor before, what other opportunities do we have to deepen our engagement with customers? And in this case, I wanna make a case for how we can use our stories. So everyone, congratulations of making it to this program, uh, pivoting your full business. Um, over the next few weeks, you are being connected to several resources from marketing to access to capital, industry best practices like JB has just covered, and even networking opportunities. What is interesting about storytelling is storytelling is one of those very few inherent assets that you have that is not external to you. Um, whether they be additional tools or resources or proposal writing, those are external. And superpower in the sense that it's with you, it's your differentiation, it sets you apart. So your story is your superpower. And as entrepreneurs, uh, we are very much driven about the bottom line, about sales and marketing, about partnerships, about hiring, but oftentimes do we go through the vulnerable journey of bringing out our own story. And oftentimes do we actually look at resources that are more inherent, uh, but rather we are all about doing, we are all about execution. And I just wanna open this perspective uh, for something you might consider. So you might have heard that people do not buy what you sell, they buy the stories that you tell. And this is a great opportunity for us because when I go on tools like Grubhub on Uber, Uber Eats and all DoorDash, all the delivery apps, and I have the opportunity to read more about the business and go to their website and actually have to identify if I might have some commonalities with this particular service provider. Um, when I have a lot of competition or options to, to, to choose from, and that is I wanna talk about how do we use our story to stress, to amplify the commonalities that we have with our business. Um, yes, we are all in the food business, but there's more to our brand and the messaging of that, it, it's this idea of brand storytelling. As I said, storytelling, obviously, as I said, is the new marketing, and that is what we are looking at. Uh, also, this idea that your story or our story is now the new About Us page. So one of the things I've been doing with LEDC clients is really helping them to craft the brand story on their own page of their website. So if you still have a bad house page that only talk about the technical description of what you do, your product and services, 
Um, this is new school. And now particularly going forward in the new normal, we want to really devote time to identify the commonalities we have with our clients. You know, we are in the situation now that we are not just competing with a small business next door, we are competing with the multinational brands and customers have a deep sense of loyalty to service providers that are connected to them. And that is why if there's one thing you take away from this conversation, if you have not yet stepped the process of capturing your creation story, your brand story on your website, um, you might want to start thinking about how to do that. For some of us, we have a story, but it's wanting to tell one story. We may need or have an opportunity to elevate that story. We might even have more stories that are more in tune and more relevant with what is going on at this particular time. And we've been helping quite a number of clients really think about how the story they are telling us is consistent with their goals. Because the story you told 10 years might not be as relevant as what the opportunities are today. So what I wanted to do is to show us like, a, like an idea, uh, a, a template, or just make like a case of a, a market leader. And fortunately, JB talked about Starbucks um, in his presentation just to build on that brand, not necessarily endorsement, but I wanted to use a brand that we all are familiar with that is in the food business that happens to be a thought leader brand in the food space and looking about what can we learn, what can we glean, what can we, what ideas can we learn from successful brand in the space in the aspect of food um, storytelling that we can all use. So the story of Starbucks goes as follows, as we all know, that Starbucks wasn't, didn't start or was not the place you go to and you bought coffee in a paper cup. Um, you go to the grocery store to buy coffee beans back in the day when they started. But through innovation and through reinvention and when they had their own opportunity to pivot, they were able to transition into Starbucks as we know it today. But that happened with a defining moment. And that defining moment happened for Howard Schultz. Um, he was in the he was in the leadership, the marketing director about that time, traveled to Italy in 1983 in the highlighted area, and was captivated with the Italian coffee bars and the romance of the coffee experience. Then it was in that moment he said he had the vision of what became Starbucks and what become this dining community workspace experience. That was a defining moment. But that defining moment did not just live in his mind or, in his, in his, or somewhere in time, it was captured on the website and it was incorporated in the business plan. And it became the language that the organization was able to utilize to make that transition. And I think this is particularly important for all of us. And as I mentioned, the story we told 10 years ago might not be relevant today. This is not the creation, initial creation story. This was like the reinvention story of the organization. So we might all might start thinking about the direction the business is going. Are we telling the right story to strengthen our brand? So I really want us to take about, um, about one or two minutes. I'm okay with silence. If you haven't, if you have a thought of inspiration and think about your own food business story. Um, when you think about your story, what comes to mind? So I wanna give us some clues, some options on the screen. And I want us to take about a two minutes um, uh, to, to see how we can start to make some notation. This is not write an elaborate story script, but this is just joining some notes of what comes to your mind. And these are the questions I really want you to think about. Um, how did you discover your passion for food? Um, where did the business idea come from? 
Um, why did you choose food? Um, with all the other options that you can choose, when or where did you decide to go into business or into the food business? Or even when you became an entrepreneur, what inspired you or who inspired you um, to go into this direction? So let's take about um, a minute uh, to just kind of whatever comes to mind, just feel free to make a notation of that. Um, don't worry about articulating the story, telling them the story. Don't even think about how this might be re received. This is just an introspection for you to go within and pull that story out. And over time, we can explore opportunities to articulate that story. Let me check. I think I have some comments or questions coming in. Okay, so while I take that, uh, is it okay? Uh, yes, so I think the question I have now that can we put the story on a YouTube page or just something that lives on the website? We want to explore all channels, including YouTube. So the, the actual text and the narration of the story is one, if we can actually animate that story and shoot a video or audio and distributing that content because there's a whole content creation, marketing, distribution, PR that goes into storytelling. So we're talking right now about the base. So absolutely the answer is yes. We want to distribute it on all platforms. So hopefully you had some ideas about your food business story and this was helpful. So let's quickly talk about it. As I said, I only have about 10 to 15 minutes um, to, to um, to do this, and if you have questions, please feel free to chat in the questions that you may have. So story monetization strategy. Um, the first one I want to talk about is telling your COVID-19, either yours is recovery or yours is resilient story. So I think if you look at what just happened with Starbucks, and that is a very, and thank you, JB, for putting that, that is a very wonderful strategy for telling a pandemic or COVID-19 story. So that story was kind of focused on how their employees, by observing safety best practices, was able to you know, shield themselves from infection. But while doing that, guess what I'm thinking about? Starbucks. So even in your business right now, the fact that your doors are still open, it's a miracle in itself. And how your team is really defying the odds and how your team is really, in spite of all the odds, is still able to serve its customer base. Um, that is a story worth telling. Um, stories are to banks what money, I'm sorry, stories are to the media what money uh, is to the bank. So the media outlets, TV station, radio station are always looking for good story to tell. So this is free publicity for everyone thinking about your recovery or resistance story. Again, you've heard everyone has a story to tell. The very fact that you're still standing in COVID-19 is a story worth telling. So I think if you look at that story case start once again, sometimes it's your entrepreneur story. Sometimes it's your employee story. Sometimes it's your customer story. But if it has some connection that has to do with COVID-19, I think people really, really want to do that. One of the clients that uh, we've been working with is in Wheaton, Maryland, connected to the LEDC program. Um, it's a very small Italian uh, deli uh, in, in the Wheaton complex. And one of the things we did I thought was brilliant was they were able to tell uh, the story of the business, but actually put it on a press release and invited the news media outlet to come cover the story. And we also had the council member uh, of that particular region come to attend. Right now, we can't do it in person, 
but we can always do it through Zoom and virtual means just telling our pandemic story. And everyone loves a good story. So I really want you to think about that for marketing. Um, also, as I mentioned, in terms of your content creation and social media, highlighting storytelling, um, you know, obviously connected to COVID-19. The second thing I would say is to fund your story banks. Um, so right now, being very much peculiar and very um, on top of collecting stories from your clients, um, you know, telling the story as well is something that you also want to do. Uh, people are looking for a reason to connect to your business. They are looking for a reason to go after the competition. And now there is no that in-person factor involved. I can go online and I can place my order. I don't feel any guilt that I'm not being loyal to my service provider. But you want to stay on top of things. Um, share your business story. Um, the, this answer the question that that came in. Um, so for those of one of the things also we've been doing uh, at the our organization is we've been helping businesses tell their story at the PS, at the point of sale, um, pretty much is a customer conversational piece. So while your customers are in line waiting to check out because now they're doing carry out. So while they're waiting in the waiting area, Utilize the real estate of your business space to actually put your story on the wall. Whether it's your personal story, your employee story, your creation stories, I think utilize that. The whole idea is you want a customer to say, oh, you too. They said that is when storytelling starts. Oh, that happens to you too. I didn't know this was a story. So that way we can deepen the connection um, that we have with uh, with the customer. And lastly, for those of us who are going back to fundraising, going back to investors, going back to banks, and even for those of us who are doing like GoFundMe, crowdfunding, we'll actually have to raise funding to stay afloat and to keep the doors open. Your story is a wonderful resource that you have. So you wanna use this opportunity to capture your story on your business plan, on your pitch video, uh, people want to see that. That storytelling is an emotional factor. It makes a case why your business should be funded as opposed to your competition. So as I said, this is nothing something that you do not know about. Storytelling is timeless. We all have a story to tell. I just want to show a perspective that I want you all to consider as we think about innovation, um, the last thought I want to leave you with is this idea that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We are all feeling the pain of what is going on right now, but are we telling that story? Are we letting that crisis go to waste? So storytelling is one of the ways in which we can change the narrative and actually unlock value from our own personal story. Um, I will stay back if you have any questions. Uh, please let me know in terms of let me see all the questions that, that we have. Um, and it's in terms of uh, contact information, uh, this is my contact information on the screen. Uh, please let us connect on social media. Let me know if you have any questions, how I may be able to support your businesses uh, going forward. Uh, thank you, JB, um, for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation again. Uh, so while we wait for JB, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Benga. Uh, that was terrific. Um, I, I had a quick question about um, kind of how you and maybe your clients use storytelling um, in kind of their problem solving mode, like uh, when they're uh, trying to, uh, whether it's uh, networking, uh, to find solutions, or uh, uh, how do they? How does how does uh, knowing their story well uh, sort of build to find solutions? Okay, I think I was going to make about ninety percent. Uh, the, the, the microphone was cutting, but I think I got the whole idea using storytelling for problem solving. Um, well, the centrality of storytelling 
is to be able to establish points of commonalities, what we have in common. And at the end of the day, um, we do not have a money problem, we have a people problem. So storytelling allows you to connect with the right people. And oftentimes, people at the end of the day really hear their story in your story. But oftentimes, we don't give people enough reasons to want to connect with us to problem solve. So again, whether we are now intentional and proactive in actually putting that story out there, um, then we can actually have more people come in play. Um, within the organization, one of the, one of the process we take clients through is this idea of helping even customers, I'm sorry, employees take ownership of the company story. Um, so if you haven't done this exercise as a visionary, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, having a conversation with your client as to this is our business story, what resonates with you, what connects with you with this story, so they can become ambassador of the particular story. You can also use story scripts. Um, so for those of you who are taking orders online and you have a sales pitch that you actually pitch to your client, uh, incorporating some element of storytelling so it can be more personable, personal, emotional, that, that emotional factor. So ultimately all about relationship building and storytelling helps to form those connection bonds. Okay, let me see if we have a question. Thank you, Benga. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. One is, uh, is this uh, business story uh, something that will be included on our website or YouTube page? Um, this will, this recording will be, I think on our Facebook page and uh, I will make sure that we send out, um, I think that, that um, uh, maybe the last one did get sent out. We'll make sure that the links and the slides uh, do definitely get sent out after this session. Um, and then there's another question about, um, so during the presentation, I believe you stated that restaurants will be chain, changing to no tip model. Um, if so, what does that mean? Not so much that they will be. Uh, it's kind of a trend uh, that had been um, uh, in place by some sort of very prominent uh, players in hospitality. Um, the best known is uh, Union uh, Square Hospitality that owns a bunch of restaurants. Ironically, um, they just recently abandoned uh, that policy. Um, but uh, to give you a quick description of how it worked, um, uh, it's designed uh, so they, they essentially put a service fee or they uh, uh, on the cost of the food, um, that's a flat rate. Um, and it's a way for them to pay their um, kind of server staff and the kitchen staff more equitably. Um, the, uh, the pandemic for this particular company, uh, Union Square uh, Hospitality, um, as I mentioned, they recently abandoned that policy, I think in part because uh, of a cash flow problem. Um, obviously, uh, the higher your, uh, um, your labor costs are, uh, the, uh, the more complicated that is, particularly in, a, in uh, this pandemic period. Um, but uh, this idea of, uh, of kind of a no-tip policy is, uh, is meant to um, uh, make the restaurant business more equitable. Uh, and it's one thing that may come out of this pandemic. Uh, uh, once things, particularly, obviously, uh, the business part of it uh, comes back to normal. Um, but um, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a definite, but it was uh, it is a, it is a trend that uh, we think may be coming. Um, great, I hope that answers your question, uh, Yadira. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat or um, uh, or also uh, just unmute and and feel free to ask. Um,
uh, uh, Benga, have you experienced uh, with any of your uh, restaurant uh, clients, uh, food-related clients, any kind of interesting uh, initiatives that they've found, discovered, uh, implemented that have kind of maybe surprised them and helped them uh, sort of survive in this uh, in this difficult period? Um, well, I think one of the model that uh, some of my clients are implementing now is story on veil, and the story on veil it's more like a client engagement strategy. And for those who have a loyal customer base um, and find a way to connect with them and they're doing it via Zoom. And for those who are periodically having means of connecting with clients and getting them online and just you know, having a more informal connection uh, where the entrepreneurs actually and the business is more of a person than a corporate establishment. And I think that is really connecting with the customer base because at this time it's just continue to make a case that uh, we have more commonalities and more than ever before this is the time to stick together so just finding ways in which to engage so doing that story on well is something i've seen some of my clients uh, do um, as i said some of the clients also in the covid19 stories I've also creatively thinking about getting press release to, uh, to media stations, to local media stations, um, you know, to just kind of show how, particularly during the uh, phase, was it phase two or three uh, being open? I think that was when many clients also say, hey, we open and this is where we open, this is our resilience and recovery effort. So, that PR and clients engagement is something clients are utilizing. Um, so question came in that should we pay customers to share stories and why of why they choose our business? Um, that is to elicit uh, video testimony that would appear inauthentic. Um, I wouldn't go out, I would try to use the language pay. It's okay to incentivize. Uh, it's okay to incentivize. Um, it's one of the things, it pretty much just how you would ask clients to leave a Google or Yelp review. Um, and some of them, some business might say you may get some discount to do so. Um, but one of the things I would rather say is you already have loyal customer base that would not hesitate and they would actually feel honored that you reach out to them to tell their story. Uh, one of the things I can say, clients cannot actually wait to talk about businesses they love because guess what, we've been doing that. We've been going to restaurants and bringing out our phone and putting on social media. So when we are even more intentional about asking them, I see customers go out of their way to be able to do so. So it is, it is okay to intensify, yeah, I'm sorry, um, incentivize, and it's okay to reach out to your loyal customer base. They'll be glad to do so. And probably as part of a broader kind of marketing plan, you, know, you, could, you, could, you could do some sort of uh, incentivize testimonials, uh, but obviously uh, to kind of encourage the ones that happen more naturally. Uh, Uh, there's a question here as well. Are your clients removing uh, the tip jar in exchange for electronic tips uh, and uh, have your clients move to cashless transactions? I think uh, the, um, uh, the answer is yeah, essentially yes to both. The, you know, uh, this is uh, um, uh, the more clients are able to streamline uh, the purchasing process, the better it is, uh, the, the, you know, the easier it is for uh, clients to process a sale, the cheaper it is to process that sale, and, uh, and definitely uh, uh, going cashless. And obviously, there's a, there's a kind of a health uh, element to, to cash transactions where, where people just don't want to be uh, uh, handling, uh, uh, handling money. Um, 
And, uh, um, you know, one uh, added comment about kind of uh, the, the electronic tip jar is that uh, we have many clients that are um, kind of communicating this idea that, uh, um, you know, that, uh, that they're in a pandemic, that they're, uh, you know, in some cases struggling to survive, and that tips are uh, kind of a, a greater awareness of how tips go to uh, helping uh, both the business survive and supporting uh, the people that work there. Uh, and I think by and large, that's been a very positive, uh, positively received uh, kind of message. Um, and also, if, if I can also add a little bit to that, but not directly, but indirectly. Um, in the McKinsey story or McKinsey case study, you highlight that, talking about how employees are becoming heroes and she rules of the businesses. Um, I would even build out a story around that uh, as part of uh, employee appreciation and, and the delivery um, employees or staff that we have to just kind of humanize the brand and actually have people have a personal connection to them and say, you know, I know a lot of people are using the third party service provider, but there's also opportunity to actually celebrate clients, I'm sorry, your employees through social media. Well, cool. thank you. Um, great. Um, well, uh, again, feel free to uh, unmute if you have a specific question uh, or put it in the chat. We've had uh, a lot of good questions so far. Um, I uh, I wanted to just remind everyone that um, we had the last uh, series of this workshop is Thursday, again at one and at three, at one in English and uh, at Spanish. And uh, we'll be talking about some operational uh, uh, issues that uh, companies are planning to get seats. There was one other comment here in the chat. Uh, only downfall of going totally cashless is that customers pay uh, via PayPal. PayPal takes three and a half percent. All of your credit card transactions are uh, fees that the company pays. And uh, that is definitely uh, uh, sort of a theme that often consumers don't always appreciate that uh, um, that uh, it's a small percentage, but it's, uh, it's a meaningful percentage to, uh, to the business. Um, and um, uh, businesses always have to balance uh, kind of the convenience uh, with, uh, you know, with the audio is not great, but um, uh, just very quickly on, um, let me see. Uh, so I guess my audio is cutting out. Benga, do you have any uh, uh, opinions on uh, on credit card fees and how they uh, affect the business? Um, well, not, I thought that was a, I think that was a point to, you know, to be mindful you know, the transaction fees on going 100%. Uh, but I think at this time, it's actually weighing the health implication of money and, and also being able to balance both. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's on the business owner to see how to do that. Um, I don't know if we have additional time. JB, there's a question for me about my own personal story. Uh, do, do, do we have time for, to do that? Yes. Um, oh, great. So thank you for the question. So I'm in the coaching space. I'm a business story coach. And I think how I got into this space was when I had my first coaching experience. And I was kind of seeking a career path or if I should go nonprofit or if I should go for profit. And I found this coach. And in our very first conversation, she said to me that if you want to help people, and if you want to make money, you are a social entrepreneur. And that conversation changed my life. I never heard 
the word social entrepreneur. And this was overseas in Nigeria. Uh, six months after that, the corporation of Microsoft had a global business plan for social entrepreneurs. And because I was just gifted this language of what I should be doing, I was able to take advantage and apply for that in as much the competition was global and very stiff. And I did win. Uh, I came to the United States um, shortly after that to the State Department. And I helped to start quite a number of international social ventures um, around the world. And when I made the pivot in my own career and I went into coaching, I realized that what is really holding so many entrepreneurs back and businesses black, back is pretty much the language they used to tell their stories. Um, when I was telling my story as a nonprofit professional, I didn't get the right opportunities. But when I have a coach that gave me the language of social entrepreneurship, uh, that really changed everything for me. So that is what I've been doing. I've been really sitting with business leaders, actually listen to them and help them audit um, the very language that we use to tell their personal story and also the business as well. I will use them to the language that embodies their business story. I work in a lot of minority communities and we are very much guilty of this uh, because we really concentrate so much, could concentrate on what is really not working on the challenges. But what I do is to help asset frame those stories so you can be more positive and forward looking. And I see that people really, customer base or investors or client, connect to them more forward looking positive stories. So that is my story. Uh, I hope uh, I was able to get that out in the limited time that I had. But thanks for asking. Very nice. Thank you. Um, Great. I think I adjusted my audio. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone can hear me. I was just going to make one additional comment to Yadira and the uh, uh, and the three and a half percent fees. Um, there's always a balance uh, that companies have to make uh, between the convenience of of uh, transacting by credit card and and the fees associated with that, and kind of what they charge for their goods. Um, and uh, sometimes. Uh, that question comes up um, when um, when a business kind of has to rethink how they're pricing, and um, uh, and if uh, both how they're pricing and then how they're communicating uh, the value of their goods to their to their clients, um, and in some cases, if it makes more sense uh, um, to convey to your clients, they get more value by not paying with a credit card. Uh, sometimes that's an effective message. Um, anyway, um, that's my two cents on credit cards. Uh, uh, Benga, I really appreciate you sharing your story as well. Um, that's, uh, uh, I know, uh, uh, I know your story well and, um, and, uh, it is, uh, uh, it's a, it's an inspiration. Uh, uh, sure. well. thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, there's also a comment there, I think, uh, directed, uh, to you, uh, Benga, uh, if, uh, from Coffee Karma. I don't know if you saw that, but. Uh, oh, yes. Um, yes, the question is, do I speak Yoruba language? It is my local dialect in Nigeria. Then, Monsa Yoruba. It's, uh, it's uh, my, my Nigerian language. Thank you for, for that question. I love that. <laughs> yes, I do. Nice. Uh, <laughs> great. Well, uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, one last reminder that uh, Thursday is the last in the series of these workshops. Um, you'll get, uh, you know, no doubt uh, a, an e-blast and maybe a text or two reminder. So we'd be grateful if you signed up for that as well. Um, and also a reminder that uh, as part of the Good Food Fund, if you think uh, we're offering uh, technical assistance on a one-on-one -on -one basis to uh, a few select uh, companies, um, businesses, and um, if there is something in particular, uh, you know, related to uh, how you're pivoting to um, uh, uh, to the pandemic, uh, and if you could use assistance specifically with that challenge, 
um, we may uh, be able to uh, we may be able to help. So please send us an email or uh, or give us a call. Um, I'll put my email again in the chat. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, staying in touch. Um, and uh, uh, and we look forward to seeing you all on, on Thursday as well. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Benga, very much. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, have a terrific afternoon.